Welcome, Sam and Felicity, and thank you so much for joining this conversation on the occasion of Sam's exhibition, Cure the Work, at Z33. We'll be discussing some of the key references in the exhibition relating to the ambiguous history of self-help housing in the so-called developing world, on which you, Felicity, have written in your book, Outlaw Territories, Environments of Insecurity, Architectures of Counterinsurgency, uh, the exhibition Cure the Work departs from the recent closure and demolition of a Ford car factory near Z33, which used to be a major employer in the region. And while this factory was undergoing demolition, the new wing of Z33 was under construction. And in this exhibition, Sam has used elements of the demolished Ford factory, as well as soil from the factory site, to set up a production line for compressed earth blocks a low-cost building material that's associated with the history of self-help housing. The stages of the production process are on display in the exhibition. And that brings me to my first question, because I wanted to start by asking you, Sam, how your practice interrogates the meaning of work. I mean, in terms of the meaning of work, I, I think in each case, work uh, is obviously naturally sort of linked to a specific organization of labor. Um, uh, an organization that is commanded um, in some sense by, I guess you'd say, an, an order of investment, um, or actually, I think it's better to say a kind of order of disinvestment, um, uh, the kind of disinvestment that's associated with global overcapacity and deindustrialization. Um, and, uh, um, so I guess as a, as a starting point, I don't ever really think about, um, I, I don't really think about the meaning of work, but about how maybe in a more circuitous fashion, um, a kind of order of work already frames my activities before I've even considered what it is I, I think I'm able to do. And I want to let that, that order of determination congeal into a sensible environment. That's sort of how, how these works can come about. In this show, you've used two portable earth ramming machines to compress the soil from the Ford factory site in Genk. And I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what motivates your choice to use industrial technologies in your work and why you were uh, specifically attracted to these portable earth ramming machines. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny because those machines themselves, I don't know if I'd call them industrial processes. Um, in a way, they, they come to, um, to fill in a sort of need in, a, in, a, in an environment of scarcity um, where um, sort of production to scale is, um, is not available. Um, and I mean, to be really honest, I, I, the way that I found them um, was uh, really just, I, I was casually looking for a way to compress some particulate matter. <laughs> and um, on, the, on the back of those, those other two projects that I mentioned, and I found on, on YouTube, actually, these, these channels of mostly Chinese manufacturers that were producing and advertising these manual presses, mostly um, marketed to NGOs operating in, in, in various countries in Africa and in South America, and also in Southeast Asia. Um, and as I, you know, try to figure out what these were, um, sort of what the context was for these. Um, it was really Felicity's work on the origins of so-called self-help housing um, from John Turner mm -hmm. the Bank to the Open Land Movement. Um, that was, it was like, it was crucial. It was a really important key to, to unlock the context for these sorts of appropriate technologies. Mm -hmm. So. For Cure, I mean, I really, I, I wanted to force together in some sense the, the remnants left by the local instance of capital flight in Hazel, um, uh, in, in an advanced industrial sector of the economy, the automotive industry, 
and this obviously smaller scale form of material mm -hmm. uh, production. There's a sort of ideological component here because speaking of flight, I mean, obviously the, the auto industry itself is in the business of catering to fantasies of unrestricted personal mobility and speed. And that's represented in the exhibition through various posters and promotional material that was that was taken directly from the factory site as it was being demolished. Um, I wanted to use the sort of ruins that were left behind um, this this sort of local instance of deindustrialization to um, to kind of configure a path that viewers take through the museum um, as as one that traces the the operation of these um, smaller scale presses, which uses the, the sort of ground that one is standing on as a, as a source of local subsistence. The earth ramming device is like such a beautiful sort of entry point into the global framework of deindustrialization. And so the way that the them brings together the earth ramming flock with the Ford factory, the sort of tensions that that juxtaposition sort of produced for me as somebody interested in this history were like so manifold. And so uh, even the the ways in which the 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 rammed earth block um, becomes not only a, a sort of material residue of these histories of of self-help um, housing, but and of course, within the context of the museum, relate to sort of post-minimalist sculpture, and as you said, site-specific artworks, and maybe even earth art, but they, they remind us that there is also an aesthetic to those blocks, even as they appear in the context of the so-called developing world. And so when those blocks appear, um, um, you know, in, in a house, whether it be in, in Peru or in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, they mark those countries as poor. Like they resonate on the one hand with vernacular constructions like adobe housing, but on the other hand, they mark them as at a sort of intermediate stage of development. Yeah, they're on the one hand, not vernacular. They're not fully industrialized. They speak to the fact that they're, um, they're, they're even, being used precisely on account of, as we talked about before, the deindustrialization of European cities. And so the I think there's this like incredibly complex triangulation where the tension between the, the sort of ruins of an industrial factory um, uh, resonate with the uh, ways in which that deindustrialization touches down in urban sites on the other side of the world is like, is really intense and provocative, which ties us also to all the ways in which former industrial sites are, of course, you know, all over the world becoming art museums and cultural centers. And, and so I think just the sort of precision of bringing together the, the, the sort of end of a genre of industrial production with its material artifacts, like the metal doors and the, the signage, yeah, the sort of organization of labor within those spaces and uh, the brick making machine is, is, is such a precise way of marking so many complex entanglements, both in the, yeah, the 1970s when the processes that we're talking about um, became central to my work. That's the moment where I see them as becoming sort of mainstreamed or, or rendered um, potentially more dangerous. Felicity, you write about well, basically how self-help was popularized by figures such as John C. Mm -hmm. Turner. And um, could you maybe for a start tell us how something like uh, self-help uh, was popularized as a development strategy? Yeah. I. It's a sort of a complicated story, um, but Turner is a very key part of it. And uh, and I mentioned that Turner's working in the context of Peru in the early 1950s and actually for, for a number of years. And, and actually at the moment where the original Sinveram that is the, the predecessor to the earth ramming device that Sam uses in the show uh, was formed in, in the context of, of this type of work in Colombia. And, 
And so to sort of literally answer your question, you could say something like Turner's publication in mainstream uh, British magazines like Architectural Design and elsewhere was one uh, sort of media vehicle to popularize these models of alternative architecture within the, the European and also within the sort of North American um, architectural discourse. But the, the popularization of it could be read in many other very distinct contexts from, um, as I mentioned, NGOs working in the context of Latin America and elsewhere who were um, out of a sense of, you know, humanitarian aid, often different forms of development aid, um, uh, intending to actually help these poor communities. But I just wanted to point out, it's, you know, already, and this certainly relates to um, to Sam's exhibition, you know, not incidental that they were large communities of um, poor people, a, a category sort of produced also under the um, logic of a sort of developmental telos that's framing this larger question. But there's large numbers of, of um, people migrating from urban, uh, sorry, from rural to urban environments as part of a, a larger sort of economic turn from an agricultural sector to an industrial sector. And so the need, I mean, I'm just coming to the forces that might have popularized the need for something like a a brick making or a, a block making device to um, enable, um, well, yeah, to enable people to um, regular, uh, sort of regularize a, a very informal mode of construction into a more formal mode. But to jump forward a little bit from the 1950s to the 1970s, really what my project was interested in doing is not so much telling the story of these initial characters, although John Turner um, certainly remains key, but trying to think of the, let's say the afterlives of those forms of popularization, both in the context of the so-called developing world and as Sam also mentioned in uh, practices like open land communes and, uh, and hippie culture for which something like the whole earth catalog might stand in for another vehicle of popularization of self-help or in in that context we might use a language like do it yourself and so what i was interested in is not so much the let's say the popularization or the ways in which these practices um, spread became known captured the imagination of different actors from architects to development agents to other forms of um, economic and technical uh, exp experts, uh, but also the way they became increasingly integrated into um, processes of, 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 of world governance. Again, in a way this ties back to what Sam mentioned around um, trying to find a way of modeling what he called the expansive circuits, expansive circuits of circulation, the, the ways in which what is happening in the so-called developed world or global north uh, touches down in very material ways elsewhere. And um, yeah, I know that's not entirely answering your question, but um, to, to really answer what popularized it would be a very extended story. And so in a way, what I'm trying to do is to understand how a practice um, that initially, um, uh, initially was uh, designed and implemented in one context, in a very specific set of contexts, uh, became um, uh, articulated with a, uh, a policy at the level of the World Bank or the IMF, and, and in which the United Nations began to recognize that, that these sorts of self-help paradigms from, um, from core housing to sites and services housing to uh, these forms of regularizing informal settlements through, through the block making devices came into a sort of a much larger formation. There are the political issues and then there are also the political economic issues which have to do with, uh, I think the, the appeal of, um, of um, in, from the 1970s on, um, uh, larger and larger uh, contractions of the global economy, grinding down growth, 
increasing precaritization, more and more informalization of you know, surplus populations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in some sense, what was interesting for me about Turner um, uh, is that his kind of abstract romanticization of a place like the squat um, mm -hmm. in Peru uh, in um, architectural design um, in the late 60s becomes a sort of um, uh, more geographically expansive um, uh, way of, of addressing this kind of inevitable um, economic slowdown that, that's happening on the level of the world economy. Yeah, exactly. And so Turner, um, Turner's like working in the field on the one hand, yes. And so, so initially he does understand the very specific um, uh, plight, for want of a better word, of um, uh, the, the sort of communities that he's working with in, in Peru. But it's true that the model becomes sort of expanded into a sort of generic system. And it's that moment where it becomes uncoupled from a particular uh, politics or economic situation or history or geography that it takes on a very different life and becomes a type of abstraction um, that can very easily find a sort of foothold in, in, in international policies. On an economic level, what uh, do you think was the actual role of self-help in the economic development of mm. these places in the so-called global south? Yeah, um, I think it would depend very much on the situation. And I say that because um, in a situation where communities were actually able to affect a certain type of agency or self-governance in the, in the use of self-help technologies to actually put them to work, to uh, render their lives um, less precarious, that, that it might well have allowed people to, to find a mode of shelter. But what I'm interested in thinking is, is um, how to put um, a situation in which people needed to build houses for themselves on the outskirts of, of cities, having been uh, dispossessed of their original form of life, which was often an agricultural form of life, like how we think that situation again in a global context and and so the question of who profits is often um, um, you know not so much those communities who were forced to build houses for themselves because the government uh, might not have the funds to actually look after them but the multinational corporations who needed cheap labor pools in the so-called developing world to fund to work in factories uh, not so much perhaps even Ford factories to come back to the context of your exhibition. Um, but as labor, as sort of industrial labor pools increasingly moved from North American and European cities to the developing world, these um, types of practices uh, we can see as um, yeah, yeah, key to the economic model that, that, that corporations were relying on to, to actually facilitate facilitate labor pools for their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I, as I understand it, part of the, um, I, once the, the sort of, um, yeah, the abstraction of, of auto construction or self-help um, uh, um, was faced with the realities of, of, of like supply chain management, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the actual cost of using these small scale technologies, then the per unit cost of all the materials skyrocketed because there was no longer that economy of scale where you had large bulk of purchases of materials. So in fact, economically, um, it was still, it was still tra trapped in the environment of um, global industrialization and striving towards attempting to kind of continually restart or maintain the, the engine of economic growth that was based on industrialization. Well, there's so much more to be said about the exhibition and about your work, Felicity, but I'm afraid we must leave it here for now. Thanks so much to both of you for joining me in this conversation. Thank you so much, Sam. <laughs>
And thank you very much, Felicity. Thank you.